You are listening to Gone But Never Forgotten. Our topics can include, but are not limited to, murder, sexual assault, graphic and gruesome details, and more. These topics are adult in nature and are not meant for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. Brandon, Manitoba is a relatively quiet town. I know because I lived there for five years of my life. I moved there in 2002, and only a few mere months after I moved there, Brandon would have a case that would shake them to their core. A grisly missing persons case that would eventually turn into a murder case. I was there when the case was closed and all of the details would come to light. It was the talk of the town, and there was plenty to talk about. Hello, and welcome to episode 19 of Gone But Never Forgotten. The Murder of Aaron Chorney. everyone and welcome to Gone But Never Forgotten. You will notice starting with this week's episode that we are going to open up the topics that we cover a little bit to include solved murders and serial killers. This is in response to many of our listeners who have said that they do believe that there are things to be gleaned and learned from cases that have been closed. Things to see in terms of warning signs and definitely stories to be told of people who are gone and the perpetrators who are possibly still living amongst us, whether that be behind bars or on the streets again. This will be our first murder case that we will discuss that did have a conviction, and the case is closed. That's right. We're nothing without our beloved listeners, and we will always try to take note of cases that people bring to us, and also compliments and criticism that we find from conversations with you. Just a reminder, we are very easy to find on social media, and we do love to interact with our fans. You can find us on Twitter at GBNF Podcast, on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash GBNF Podcast, on Instagram at GBNF Pod, and of course on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash GBNF Podcast. We can also be emailed at gbnfpod at gmail.com. And Julie is working on a TikTok account, so watch for that in the near future. We appreciate all compliments, criticisms, and comments, so please feel free to reach out. With the housekeeping out of the way, why don't we get down to business of telling the story of Aaron Chorney? That sounds like a plan. Erin Kristen Chorney was a bright and bubbly 18-year-old woman who was living in Brandon, Manitoba at the time of her disappearance. She was extremely close with her family and her parents described her as a rebellious spirit who was incredibly outgoing and loved to be around her friends at every possible opportunity. Erin's parents, Debbie and Darcy, were divorced, but from all vantage points, the family seemed to continue to work very well after the divorce and Erin spent equal amounts of times with her mom and her dad. Erin was known to be a partier, but that is not to say that her partying got out of hand all the time, so to speak. It was more an avenue for her to tap into that outgoing nature and be around as many friends as possible at any given time. Erin did have her struggles, certainly, as most teenagers do. She was prone to things like mood swings, and even at the age of 14, she had an incident where she took 30 Tylenol pills in an attempt to take her own life. Erin was known by her friends and family to have been predictably unpredictable, but everyone that knew her said that she was indeed one of the kindest, 
most caring people that they had ever met, and that she was above and beyond all else a very intent listener. Erin definitely seemed as though she was a lot like myself and most teenagers that I have known or seen. She appeared to be someone who was constantly looking to find exactly who she was and exactly what she was meant to do. Erin was definitely all over the map in most areas of her life. That much is for sure. But at the age of 18, who wasn't? She was known to go into party binges that could last days and even a week at a time, often not telling her parents where she was, but always staying in touch to let them know that she was safe. She was a dreamer. She wanted to be a writer, a counselor, or a defense attorney, depending when you spoke to her. But one thing was for sure. Erin wanted to be noticed. Erin wanted to stand out. And most of all, Erin wanted to be known by those around her. Unfortunately for Erin and everyone that knew her, she would become very well known for all of the wrong reasons. It was in 2001, a year before Erin's disappearance, that she would meet her boyfriend, Michael Bridges, at a bar. They were both there with friends, and Bridges was dating one of Erin's friends. Bridges and his girlfriend at the time had a disagreement at the bar, and Bridges stormed out of the room. Aaron, ever the caring person, followed Bridges, and the two of them started to have a conversation about the argument. And that stretched on as they talked about many more things and discovered that they in fact had quite a connection. In my experience, that is never quite the way you want to meet someone. Generally, when you see a situation that looks not so great between two people that are in a relationship, that's something that you probably want to steer clear of. But for Erin, I believe she saw the best in people. Erin was one of those people, like myself I think, who knows all that they have been through and all that they have persevered through and feels that they need to try to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Not long after their chance meeting, Bridges would break up with his girlfriend, and Aaron and Bridges would begin dating. Initially, both of Aaron's parents said that they thought that Bridges seemed to be a very polite and sincere young man. Aaron's dad had since said that he had had a few conversations with Aaron about Bridges after they had been dating for a while, and that she had indeed told him that Bridges tended to be a rather abusive person at times, even being controlling, jealous, and violent. She said that Bridges had not ever been violent towards her, but that he would often yell and scream at her in arguments, and that he had broken her things in fits of rage when they were arguing. He was adamant that she be with him at all times, not even allowing her to see her friends without him present. Yeah, he definitely seems like an incredibly jealous and controlling man. I think that a lot of us have sadly been in this situation with a partner where they start to treat us like an object or something that is owned rather than someone that we are in a partnership with. It's heartbreaking to see, it's heartbreaking to live through, and as most people know, most times things do not end well in situations like this. Things tend to escalate in situations like this rather than de-escalate, and this situation was sadly not any different. On March 10th, 2002, Aaron and her friend Lindsay went over to Bridges' house. He lived with his mom, and as the night progressed, Lindsay fell asleep and Aaron and Bridges would continue drinking. At around 6.30 a.m., Bridges had gotten incredibly drunk and he started to argue with Aaron. As the argument escalated, he grabbed Aaron around the neck with both of his hands climbed on top of her and started to squeeze so that she could not breathe. He then would slam her head against the wall several times. In defense, Aaron grabbed his lip and pulled hard while also trying to get him off of her. Obviously, the noise of the scuffle was escalating as Aaron tried to stop Bridges' attack, and this awakened Lindsay in the other room. Lindsay then entered the room and punched Bridges in the head, which stopped him and he was momentarily in a state of shock, and Lindsay was able to get Aaron out from underneath of him. Bridges, then in a state of rage, attacked Lindsay as well, punching her in the stomach multiple times. At this point, 
Bridges' mom awakened as well and started screaming until everyone finally stopped. At which point, Bridges then told his mom that Aaron and Lindsay had attacked him unprovoked, and the young women obviously told her that they were defending themselves from Bridges, not the other way around. Bridges' mom then drove both back to Aaron's father's house where they told him about the entire ordeal. Aaron told her dad that she wanted to press charges against Bridges and he drove both Aaron and Lindsay to the police station where both Aaron and Lindsay filed statements that corroborated their individual stories. Part of the statement that Lindsay filed said that when she came into the room and saw Bridges with his hands around her throat, he was also yelling at her that he wanted to kill her. Later on that day, March 11th, 2002, Bridges was arrested and charged with assault causing bodily harm and choking someone to overcome resistance. Bridges would refuse to say anything to the police, instead asking for a lawyer. Two days after the assault and the arrest, Bridges would be released on bail with the condition that he would not be in contact in any way with either Lindsay or Aaron. Unfortunately, as is often the case in situations like this one, those bail conditions would not be adhered to, and Aaron and Bridges would continue to see one another even after the charges were laid, and even though Aaron was telling people that she had, or was going to, end the relationship completely. Over the next few weeks, there would be more incidents involving Bridges and Aaron. Once, while Aaron was at Bridges' house, they got into an argument and Bridges locked Aaron out of the house in just a t-shirt and underwear in frigid cold temperatures. Thankfully, in that situation, Bridges' mother eventually noticed what was going on and let Aaron back into the house. Another time, while at a bar with Bridges and some friends, he would get into an argument with Aaron and he started to drag her around the bar. He would, have, he would have to be forcibly removed from the bar by a bouncer. Finally, another time, showing just how brazen he was, he would run into Aaron at a restaurant with her father, and when Aaron and her dad went to leave, Bridges blocked Aaron and said that she was not allowed to leave without him. Aaron's dad asserted himself here and said that they were in fact leaving, and they were able to leave together. There were also reports from friends of Aaron of other manipulative and obsessive traits from Bridges, such as calling her house for an hour on end to try and get her on the phone. Aaron did finally explicitly tell Bridges as well that the relationship was over, but Bridges was not willing to let it or her go. On April 20th, 2002, the day before Aaron went missing, there was, a con there was contact once again from Bridges to Aaron, this time through a friend of his, also named Michael. This was because a part of the stipulations that had been placed on Bridges pertaining to the bail and the charges against him was that he was not allowed to make any direct contact like phone calls to Aaron himself. As the family sat down to dinner that day, a phone call came in for Aaron. The call was very short, and Aaron hung up the phone. The phone would then ring a second time, and a third time. The second call was short, and the third call was longer, and Aaron would finally tell her parents that she was going out for coffee with friends. Aaron would get in the back seat of a four-door car with two people inside, but nobody got a good look at who Aaron was with when she left the house. At about 2 a.m., Aaron's 16-year-old brother Ryan would get a call from Aaron. Ryan said that he could tell she was drunk and it sounded as though she was at a party. Aaron asked her brother if he would be willing to pick her up, something that she was apt to do. Unfortunately for Aaron and for everyone else involved, on this night, Ryan said no. He was busy with other things and did not have time to come and pick Aaron up and he had class in a few hours. This would heartbreakingly be the last time that Ryan or anyone else would hear from Aaron. Even though Aaron did not return home the next day, her family was not concerned. It was a regular occurrence for Aaron to go out and spend days partying. What did start to bother her mom, though, 
was the fact that Aaron did not call to check in. That was something that Aaron had always been very good at. Even though she loved to party, she also made sure that her family knew where she was and that she was safe. The second day, Aaron's mom started to get more concerned and started to make phone calls to Aaron's friends to see if she could make contact or at least find out where Aaron was. This was sadly to no avail. At this point, Aaron's mom and dad spoke and decided they would not panic just yet and that they would hold off on reporting her missing to the police. As mentioned, they were used to Aaron being gone for longer periods of time, and on top of that, she was now legally an adult as she was 18 years old. They felt it was too soon for Aaron to be reported missing, and as she was an adult, they assumed that the police would not take their concerns seriously anyways. On April 27, 2002, six days after Aaron left her parents' home for coffee with two unknown people, Aaron's parents went to the Brandon police to report Aaron missing. They made the police aware that Aaron was on antidepressants and that they were indeed worried that she did not have any medication, money, or anything else that she would potentially need to survive. They also did tell police that they believed that the person that Aaron had left with was her ex, Bridges. They believed that that was why she had not told them where she was going or who she was going with. They also told the police that there was in fact that outstanding assault charge filed against Bridges by Aaron, so that the police would understand why they were concerned if that was indeed the case. A press release was sent out regarding the disappearance of Aaron. Unfortunately, it did not take long for the police to find something else that was very concerning. As they went through the charges that were filed against Bridges, they realized that Bridges had entered a plea deal in regard to the charges against him. He had pled guilty to two of the assault charges against him, the lesser two charges, and in turn had been given only two years of probation and was also ordered to have zero contact with Aaron or with her friend that was involved, Lindsay. Bridges had also agreed to take anger management courses and also seek help for addiction. This plea deal was concerning because Bridges had entered the plea deal just one day before, on April 26, six days after Aaron had gone missing. The police would begin their search in earnest interviewing anyone and everyone that they could. The things that continued to come up were things that we've already mentioned here. Friends brought up Aaron's love for parties and drugs and alcohol, and friends also brought up the terrible relationship that Aaron had been in with Bridges and the toxicity of said relationship. Based on the testimony of people that knew Aaron best, the police now had enough evidence to bring Bridges in for questioning. During his interview with police, Bridges seemed to start off pretty open about things. He confirmed that he had indeed been the person that Aaron had left the house with on the 20th. He then said that he and Aaron had gone back to his house because it was quiet there because his family was gone away. He then said that Aaron told him that she needed to leave. She left his house at 11.30 p.m. and that was the last time that he had seen her. She had not told him where she was going. When the police asked him about his plea deal, he told police that after speaking with Aaron, he had decided that it was best to just own up to what he had done and face the consequences so that he could move on with his life. He wanted to retain a friendship with Aaron, he said. One thing that stood out to officers during this interview was that all of Bridges' answers seemed to be rehearsed and prepared. They also found it quite strange that he seemingly had no emotions towards Aaron being missing, as he told officers that he just believed that Aaron was out partying and was seeking attention. When the tapes of the interview were studied, Many of his body actions caught the eyes of investigators along with the fact that he was speaking of Aaron in the past tense. Police believed they were on the right track. They asked him if he would be willing to take a polygraph test. He said that he would. Police believed that Bridges knew where Aaron was and that if something had happened to her, they believed that he was likely involved. 
However, without any concrete evidence to hold him or charge him, police had to let him go. Even though police believed that they had their person of interest, they did not want to close down any other avenues and continued to interview family and friends of Bridges and of Aaron. Trying as hard as they could to disqualify as many people as they could from the case, all the while trying to find evidence that would allow them to get warrants on Bridges. During these interviews, police did find out a little bit more information, including the reason why Bridges was trying so hard to get back in touch with Erin even after she had ended things. Bridges had decided that the best way for him to get rid of the charges against him was to convince Erin to have them dropped. He had pulled his resources and decided that he was going to offer Aaron a considerable amount of money to have her do exactly that to save him from going to jail. After finding this information out, police again brought Bridges in for questioning. Point blank, Bridges was asked if he knew what had happened to Aaron and if he had been involved with her disappearance. Bridges' response was a curt no. Then... Like the wise ass that he seems to be, he told police that if they had any reason to believe that he was involved at all, or that he was a suspect, they would be investigating his house and everything that he owned. He knew that, because they weren't doing so, they must not have any concrete evidence against him. When police asked him again if he would be willing to take a lie detector test, this time he said no. He said his lawyer and his father had told him that he should not take one. As much as the police believed that much more was known by Bridges, they had no hard evidence that could get them any further down that path. The police tried to find anything that they could to get themselves a warrant to search his house. They had undercover police officers canvass the area and watch the area but it was assumed he was aware that they were there and they were watching because he did nothing out of the ordinary and hardly left the house. Meanwhile, by the end of May, keeping all avenues open, police had fielded over 150 tips pertaining to seeing Aaron or possible evidence that would let them know where Aaron had gone. None of the tips ended up getting them any closer to solving the case. In mid-June 2002, the police had managed to get a warrant to search Bridges' mother's vehicle as they had proof that that was one of the last spots that Aaron had been seen, and they were operating under the impression that if something had indeed happened to Aaron, it had likely taken place in that vehicle. The car was tested for any kind of blood or chemicals that could have been used to cover up a crime. Nothing came back. The car had been eliminated as a crime scene. In late July of 2002, police had finally managed to get a warrant to search Bridges' house. Unfortunately, they found absolutely nothing that was of use in terms of physical evidence. All that was found was a note from Bridges to himself that laid out in detail everything that he had said to the police thus far. At their wit's end, police realized that they were not getting any further along with the case and that they needed to start spreading their resources back out to other cases and other areas. Tips were running cold, and with no new information or leads to run with, things were not looking good. In the spring of 2003, though, something new happened. A letter was delivered to the Chorney House, and the writer of the letter made it sound pretty clear that they knew what had happened to Aaron. The author wrote to the family that they were incredibly sorry for what had happened to Aaron. A second letter was found in a public washroom, and that letter said that the author was sorry and that a friend had tried to convince them to go to the police with what they knew, but they couldn't. The writer of the second note also seemed to taunt police a little bit, by telling them that they had gotten so close to finding the body, and that the, and the second letter also said that Aaron had been buried. It was unknown if this letter was actually written by someone that knew where Aaron was or not. The letters were tested extensively for fingerprints and DNA, but none was to be found. The police decided to try and coax the author out and see if they could get another letter. 
So they took to the media and published ads in newspapers asking for the author of the letters to come forward for questioning. This tactic worked, sort of, as one more letter was written. The letter stated that Aaron was in fact dead and that the author had seen the burial site themselves. As frustrating as it was that they could not find the writer, this brought attention anew to Aaron's case. At this time, the police now reached out to the RCMP. They still believed that Michael Bridges was the suspect in this case, and they believed that this case could be closed. They simply believed they needed one piece of evidence to start to put it all together. The Brandon police and the RCMP made the decision that they would use a Mr. Big Sting operation. Okay, can I stop you there? I'm sure that many of our listeners are unaware of what a Mr. Big operation is. Could you lay that out for us a little bit? Absolutely. This is taken directly from Wikipedia. Mr. Big, sometimes known as the Canadian Technique, is a convert investigative procedure used by undercover police to elicit confessions from suspects in cold cases. (coughs) Police officers create a fictitious gray area or criminal organization and then seduce the suspect into joining the organization. This is done by building a relationship with the suspect and gaining their their confidence. Then, they get the suspect to help them with a string of criminal acts such as theft, selling contraband, delivering goods, and things of that nature for which they get paid. Once the suspect trusts the system and the person that brought them in, they're generally persuaded to divulge information from their own criminal history so that they can officially be invited into the crime family. The technique has been around since the early 1990s and has been fairly successful. As of 2008, police have either cleared or charged 75% of their suspects that were involved in a Mr. Big sting. Of those prosecuted using the Mr. Big technique, roughly 95% have been convicted in the end of the crime that they were prosecuted for. Wow, is that something that's used around the world? I assume that it's probably more popular here since you said that it's also called the Canadian technique. Well, yeah, this technique is used in various forms around the world. However, there are also many countries around the world that have actually banned this kind of technique as well. It's often viewed as a form of entrapment. On top of that, each particular sting operation costs approximately $150,000, and that's over and above the normal use of police resources on any given case. The problem is that some suspects have given confessions as a part of the sting operation, only for their confession to be thrown out of court because the judge believed that the confession was coerced instead of given freely. So... As you can imagine, in any Mr. Big Sting, the police need to work incredibly hard to stick with their script in order to ensure that any confession that they're given can be used in court and will hold up. I can definitely see why this would be banned in some countries. It definitely seemed like a very delicate practice and one that can simply cost a lot of money if it's not done precisely right. I guess one of the worst things that can happen would be getting a confession laying charges, and then losing the case because the basis of the charges is thrown out. Exactly. It truly can be make or break. All right, I feel like we got the point across. Let's get back to the story here and talk about how this played out. Essentially, we will start by laying out the scope. The Brandon police and the RCMP devised a sting that would involve 15 undercover officers who would pose as part of a powerful and wealthy crime syndicate. They also enlisted Bob Morrison as part of their case. He was Manitoba's senior crown attorney at the time. They enlisted Bob to ensure that everything was done legally and according to the book so that they would not jeopardize their case against Bridges. The police knew few things about Bridges, but they did know that he loved attractive women and he loved sports, especially hockey. So that is how it all began. An undercover police officer came to Bridges' house posing as a marketing representative for a local radio station. Originally, he seemed reluctant to participate, 
But when he found out that he would have a chance at winning a trip to Calgary to watch the NHL's Calgary Flames play a game, he seemed much more enthused. A short time later, he was contacted and told he had been chosen as one of the winners and would indeed be headed to Calgary for an NHL game. When he arrived at the arena, he was introduced to other winners of the contest, all of which were undercover police officers. During the game, conversation was struck up between Bridges and one of the other winners, who we will later refer to as Agent X, and eventually it came out that that man was part of said successful crime organization. Over time, Bridges was befriended by the undercover officer and enlisted into the crime syndicate. Bridges would then partake in quite a few criminal activities in order to gain clout within the organization. He quickly realized that he enjoyed this style of life as he was being paid quite handsomely for his work, and he wanted more. The undercover officer would constantly tell Bridges that he could definitely be part of the syndicate if he continued to work hard and if he was willing to be honest, loyal, and truthful about everything. This included the need for Bridges to eventually speak with the leader of the syndicate, Mr. Big, and if he was willing to come clean about any crimes that he had committed in the past, that would be very helpful to his cause. It was stressed that the reason for this was twofold. They needed to vet potential members so that they knew who they were inviting in and what they had done so there were no surprises. Secondly, Bridges was also told that there was a strong potential that Mr. Big would be able to clear all charges and erase things from his past as long as he was honest. As you can imagine, sometimes for these sting operations to be believable, things need to happen that are very drastic. In this particular case, Agent X, who was the officer that befriended Bridges, staged a beating out of anger towards another member of the criminal organization that was a female. The beating was staged in front of Bridges for him to watch. This stage assault was done for two reasons. First, to show Bridges what would happen if someone lied to Mr. Big. Second, to hopefully open conversation with Bridges about violence against women. After Agent X finished his brutal assault on the female, he asked Bridges if the attack had shocked or bothered him. Bridges replied by telling Agent X that it had not, and that he would have done the exact same thing. Over time, this opened some conversation as Bridges did admit that he had been charged with assault in the past. However, when pressed for names or circumstances, he evaded the questions. He once even told Agent X that he had never actually hit a woman before and that the charges were all lies, but that he had thought about beating up women at times before. Four months into his ascent into this crime organization, in January of 2004, Bridges was told that the meeting was finally coming, and again he was reminded that as long as he was open and honest about his past, there was no crime that would disqualify him from the syndicate. In fact, odds were that Mr. Big could make all of it go away. Finally, Agent X got Bridges to talk. He said that he had killed his ex-girlfriend, but that it was an accident. He said that the two had gotten into an argument, and she had become pushy, so he shoved her back. He said that when he shoved her, she fell and hit her head on a coffee table and died right there. He said that he then took off all of her clothes and burned them. He then wrapped her hands and feet in plastic wrap and wrapped the body up in a sheet and took her to the cemetery that his father worked at and dug up a fresh grave. Then he took the body in his mother's car and buried her about two feet deep in that grave. He did not, however, tell Agent X who the girl was. At this point, the police were trying to get any more information that they could, and Agent X then asked Bridges to take him to the cemetery where his ex-girlfriend was buried. When they were there, Bridges said that he could not remember exactly whose grave he had buried his ex-girlfriend in any longer, only that he thought that the name was something similar to Brodzik. The next day, the two met up again, and this time Bridges was a little bit more open about things. 
He named Aaron specifically and said that around 2 a.m., he and Aaron had gotten into an argument about the charges against him. Michael grabbed her by the neck and choked her unconscious when she did not agree to his plans to make the charges go away. He then dragged her into the bathroom, undressed her, and shoved her entire body into the bathtub. He said that he cleaned her body to remove all DNA and then wrapped her in a white sheet and went to bed. The next day was when he buried Aaron in the fresh grave. He said that he had cut up all of Aaron's clothing and belongings and over time had slowly discarded all of them. All of the belongings were gone by the time the police searched his house. Finally, the police had what they needed. They needed to get as many details as they could, and they also wanted to get bridges for first-degree murder. That meant that they needed to get the confession on video, not just audio. Bridges was told that he was going to meet Mr. Big. Agent X told Bridges to clear his schedule for the week so that he could be ready at a moment's notice when Mr. Big was available. The police were now springing into action. On February 11th, 2003, police started to set up at the cemetery. They checked for recently deceased people who had been buried at the cemetery that Bridges' father worked at within approximately six months of Aaron's disappearance. The results were then narrowed down to people who had a name similar to Brodzik. Just after midnight, four holes were planned to be made with all precautions taken to ensure that evidence would not be disturbed. As they started to dig the third hole, they found a white sheet about two feet down. The time had come for Bridges to meet Mr. Big. On February 12th, Bridges and Agent X went to Winnipeg for the meeting with Mr. Big. While they were waiting, he was told that Mr. Big was running late. So, they went on a phone call with Mr. Big that was being recorded. The first question that Mr. Big asked was what Bridges' ex-girlfriend's name was. This time, he said Aaron Chorney. As he relayed all of the information that he had previously said, he showed no sorrow, sadness, or remorse whatsoever. He even added in more detail to ensure that Mr. Big would not think he was lying. He said that when he invited Aaron over, he had no intention of killing her. He just wanted to hang out with her. However, when they started to drink and talk about the assault charges, things escalated quickly and became physical. He said that she started to try to hit him, and in defense he grabbed her around the neck. He choked her for around two minutes and said that she was, he was overtaken by adrenaline as he accidentally choked Aaron. When he stopped choking her, he said that she was wheezing. He realized that she was going to die, and he said that he had to finish her off because he knew he was already fucked. He said that even if she was only brain dead, he was going to jail. He then cut the cord off of a family appliance and choked her with that for over a minute, but that she would just not die. He said that he then took her to the bathtub and that she was so close to death and had no fight left in her that he stuck her head in the bathtub and didn't even need to hold her underneath the water. That's when he went to sleep until the next day when he would transport her and bury her at the cemetery. Once he buried Aaron's body, he placed a piece of cardboard atop the pile to make the topsoil look even so it wouldn't catch anyone's eye. At this point, there was no reason for Mr. Big to arrive. Officers knew that they had everything they needed to arrest Bridges. As they continued the ruse of waiting for Mr. Big, Bridges continued to tell Agent X in braggadocious manner about his continuous pattern of mistreating and abusing women, proudly and seemingly happy to get all of it off his chest to someone who seemingly did not judge him for it. As he was talking, the door opened and officers swarmed the room, arresting him for the murder of Aaron Chorney. Bridges was stunned. All that he could muster was to keep asking if Agent X was a police officer the entire time. From there, officers began to dig up the body of Aaron Chorney. Because the ground was so hard, in the midst of a Manitoba winter, they had to first defrost the ground using boiling water before they could even dig. 
Aaron's exact cause of death was never able to be determined because of the shape of her remains, but there was discoloration around her throat, so there was proof that she had been choked by hands or a ligature. The medical examiner thought that drowning made the most sense as a cause of death. The ligature marks around her neck were determined to have not been sufficient to cause death, which also led the examiner to surmise that if Bridges' story was in fact true and that she was still breathing slightly when he stopped choking her, she very well could have been resuscitated and saved at that point. This is so sad. Bridges really does seem like a complete ignorant ass on top of being a murderer. Yeah, this guy's pretty bad. Uh, I wish I could say that it's rare to see a killer who seems to be proud of what he has done, but sadly, it's not all that rare. Going back to the Mr. Big thing, I think that it definitely takes a special kind of suspect also for this to work, because you almost need to know that they were broken enough before or after the incident that they'll just commit to a life of crime. If something like this is even capable of being some kind of accident, it surely doesn't seem like this one was. Sure, he had to live with it, but he also, he almost seemed like he was proud of the special kind of asshat that he was. Bragging. It makes me sick. Yeah, I have to admit, somehow it is easier to cover some of the unsolved cases than to read through and hear graphic details of how someone took someone else's life and why. Another case of someone thinking that everyone around them should save them from their own bad decisions and their own mistakes and then absolutely going out of control when they are denied. Originally, the police charged Bridges with second degree murder, but it didn't take long for them to upgrade the charges to first degree murder as they believed that they had the case to do so. In June of 2005, the trial began and Bridges was face to face with his friend, who was actually an undercover agent as he testified against Bridges. On July 29, 2005, Michael Bridges was found guilty of murder in the first degree and handed a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. The defense team for Bridges did appeal the first degree murder charge, arguing that Bridges sweetened his story for the crime syndicate so that it would appear that it was planned and so that they would be impressed by him and hopefully move him further up the food chain where he could make even more money working with them. The appeal was thrown out. In April of 2021, Bridges was again back in court. This time, as he tried to use the faint hope clause to allow himself to apply for parole early. The faint hope clause is a clause that has now been repealed in Canada However, prisoners who committed their crime prior to that repeal date, December 2nd, 2011, are still allowed to attempt to use it. It's a clause that allows anyone who's convicted and given life imprisonment with more than 15 years before parole eligibility to apply for early parole after they've served 15 years. Bridges took to the stand during his week-long trial regarding the faint hope clause and tearfully apologized to the family members of Aaron Chorney who were in the room. He told the courtroom that he was experiencing pure rage when he killed Aaron. Aaron's family also spoke at the trial, speaking about the absolute horror that Bridges has caused them and the pain that is not that is still not gone to this day. Previously, Bridges had asked to be able to speak with the family face to face, but the family has always declined. On April 9th, 2021, it was announced that the jury for the faint hope hearing had decided that Bridges would be allowed to apply for early parole. He will be eligible to apply for early parole as of June 2026, nearly three years earlier than the February 2029 as would be dictated by the life sentence. Anything you want to say in closing about this case, Julie? Anything about Mr. Big or the parole hearings or the case itself? Um, yeah, I think this case is really interesting. There's so many components to it, but I think at the end of the day, it just comes down to um, getting, getting the bad guy and doing whatever you need to do to get them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, you can see 
what a tightrope this Mr. Big thing can be. Yeah. Um, I mean, everything has to fall into place perfectly for it to be a success. If you have one minor slip up or mistake, like the whole thing can fall apart. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for me, this case was definitely an easy choice when we decided to change the format of the show a little bit. Um, as mentioned, like I moved out to Manitoba when I was 18, which was 2002. So kind of right in the middle of this. And I was telling you right before we recorded the show, like this was the talk of the town, this missing girl. Um, I remember hearing all kinds of things. And it's funny, as I was researching the case again and putting it all together, there were things that I heard that must have been like eyewitness reports or rumors. And it kind of lets you know what happens in a town like that. Yeah. Um, I Like I remember distinctly hearing that he wrapped the body in a sheet and took it to the cemetery in the back of like one of those big plastic wagons. Mm -hmm. That was the talk of Brandon. And obviously like that's not what happened. He took it. He took Aaron's body in his mom's car. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, obviously like there's always rumors until actual hard evidence comes out. Um, but I'm really happy that they got him, even though it's, you know, kind of sucks that he gets that early parole. I am happy that he's been there for that many years and hopefully, you know, he, um, has actually some remorse because this poor girl, not only did he kill her, he also, it didn't seem like he gave her a very nice time while she was alive, you know, like, um, this just domestic violence and all that stuff is not good. So it's just very sad overall because, uh, I feel like could have been avoided or maybe someone should have stepped in or said like, you know, you're not going there or whatever, you know, there's so many what ifs, but I do want to focus on Erin and just, um, her situation. In closing, there's two things that I feel really led to say here. Um, first of all, my heart goes out to her brother, Ryan, in this case, because, I can only, I can't imagine Mm -hmm. how heartbreaking it is that, you know, he had a busy day the next day and he didn't go pick Aaron up. So my heart goes out to him and anyone. If you ever find yourself in this situation where something happens and you didn't react to something, hindsight's 2020. And like, we can all go back and find ways to blame ourselves for anything. Yeah. uh, Much less, you know, the murder of a family member. So If you find yourself living with that kind of grief, definitely seek help. And this is my impassioned plea to just tell you, it's not your fault. You know, if you're Ryan or you're someone out there that maybe did or didn't do something, don't beat yourself up for it because it's not worth it. Um, It's very obvious that um, unfortunately, you know, these things, things were going to happen and it's not your fault. Yeah. The second thing I want to say is if you find yourself in a situation where you are being abused by um, your partner, your friend, anyone really, call the authorities. Um, Call the hotlines. There's hotlines in every province in Canada. There's hotlines in in the country. Um, No matter what country you live in, there's phone numbers. There's people that will try to help you and that will try to get you out of harm's way in the best way possible. So please, if you find yourself in that situation, reach out and get some help. Um, You know, as someone who lived through a relationship that was abusive, it's not easy to get that help. um, But you have to get that help because things do tend to escalate rather than de-escalate. Absolutely. And I will say, like you said, Lance, um, to the victim of any situation like this, it is never your fault. Even in this situation, it wasn't Aaron's fault. The only person's fault it is is the perpetrator. So without any further ado, I'll leave it at that. Um, We'd like to thank you again for listening and supporting us here at Gone But Never Forgotten, and we'll see you next time.